and then next week we will conclude the study as I've said. Now this week's study is a continuation of last week's study very aptly where we will unpack what we started touching on last week which was the armor of God. Before we go any further, if you are in Ephesians already, we can read on from verse 10 onwards. I'm reading from the NIV. You follow in your version or your translation that you have there. I'll give you a moment to get there. That's Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 10 onwards. And once we've done that, we will cover the memory text for today as well, which is chapter 6 verses 16 and 17. I'm reading in your hearing. Finally be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then. Verse 14 encourages us. With the belt of truth buckled around our waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Verse 16. This is our concentrating verse for this week. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then verse 18 encourages us further where it says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints and then pray for me that what whenever i open my mouth words may come be given to me as i will fearlessly fearlessly make known the mysteries of the gospel and then verse 20 for which I am an ambassador in change. In chains, pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Now that's a mouthful, but that is what we are going to discuss this morning. And I say discuss because this is not a presentation, it's a discussion. Now the title for this week's study is Waging, wa waging I almost said it, Waging War, but Waging Peace. Okay? Now, the study for this week, I felt that I was in a literature class, Elder Adams, where Paul brought out a lot of symbolism. And I felt that I was back in school in referring to the symbolism that he was actually talking about and using the army and using the attire of the army, the armor as a metaphor in explaining. And in good reason why Paul approached this part of this letter in that way. Because he wanted to make it real in my mind to the Ephesians. That is what they were seeing, experiencing, feeling, threatened by. And that was wherever they went, that was their circumstance. Oppression by the Roman army. So they saw the army. They saw the armor. They felt the oppression. They physically saw the helmet, the breastplate, the shield, the sword, and all of that. And Paul very aptly thought that, let's use this everyday examples and translate it. And use it to minister. And use it to encourage instead of letting it reflect the oppressive metaphors that it is there for them to observe on a daily basis. And Paul, in prison, must have been receptive from the Ephesians in a very strange manner 
in saying that this prisoner is writing to us about an army and an army of God and we must wage peace. How do we do that? How do we go further from that? And the Bible study starts out by saying that we need to be a church unified. We need to be an army unified. Now are we going out there to fight a battle? This is a question that I need for you to think about and I need for you to really consider this. Are we going out there gearing ourselves from head to toe with an army, with an armor, ready to fight in an army? Do we think ourselves as Christian soldiers? What is our approach to that? How do we view ourselves? Because the Bible says that it starts out by saying, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God and take your stand. What does that mean for you? Does that really mean that we are
Church, now we need to be a unified army going forward in wearing the armor of God. Okay? The Bible study notes three things in Sunday's part. It notes Paul's as the general of the army. And Christian warriors, he reminds us that we are those Christian warriors. He says that there is a battle to be fight or to be fought. And then he says that the commander in chief of this army already won the battle. Now with that information in mind, are we ready to take up our stand? God's providing the armor, the army, and the victory. My question is, is there still a war to be fought? Come now, this is where we discuss. Is there still a war to be fought within, when we have those aspects already? The commander-in-chief has won the ultimate battle for us. He obtained the victory over sin for us on the cross. Paul is saying that we as Christian warriors need to take up our fight daily. We need to put on the armor daily. That the commander-in-chief has got, obtained the victory for us in ourselves. Is then the need to wage peace? I ask you. Thank you for that point. Any other comments? While you're thinking, last week I made, a, made the, uh, the point or the comment in saying that spiritual warfare is real. It's real, beloved. And the spiritual warfare might not be as we seen on the TV, demons and exorcism taking place and stuff like that. The spiritual warfare is the point that Elder Adams touched on. Is our self-talk. What do we tell ourselves how worthy or unworthy we are? How do we tell ourselves where do we go in our Christian walk? What do we do? What do we experience on a daily basis? What do we do in our quiet time, in our spiritual edification? What do we do there? Do we just go through the motions? Do we grow every day? Are we striving to be a Daniel in, in, in the physical Literal sense in uh, the pathfinders taught me keep the morning watch and say evening prayers. What about the rest of the day? Do we just hand it over to whoever that big spirit in the sky and then tonight we come and we say thank you Lord that we've made it? Or do we at lunchtime, besides this for what we're about to receive, we actually bend our knee and saying Lord, it's midday. I'm here with you now. Be with me further until the end. 
Do we, do we do that? Do we aspire to do that? Or do we just go through the motions? Okay, I, I bought a devotion, so I didn't read yesterday, so tonight I'll read twice. That, that, that is the kind of warfare that, that I'm referring to in that, beloved, we need to realize the dependence that we have on Christ. Not on a daily basis, I want to say from moment to moment. Moment to moment. There, there were comments made in saying that I don't know how I got through the week. I don't know how I survived the month or whatever. But Jesus knows what we need. The Lord knows what we need. And this is what Paul is talking about or referring to when, he, when the Bible study approaches Monday's part and it talks about the belt and the breastplate. Paul uses the metaphor of the belt in the armor and he uses the, 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 the Roman soldier's uniform where the belt sort of ties the armor together around the waist and it ties together. But from the belt, there are other protective aspects flowing down. It's leather and metal combined, which serves as protection, but it also serves a function in keeping the armor together. Paul uses that keeping together, combining aspect, and relates it to truth. What does the Bible say? The truth shall set you free. Free from what? Free from that captive thoughts. Free from that unworthy thoughts. And I'm not saying that we should put ourselves in that pedestal and saying, I'm the man. I'm saying the truth that Christ died for us and we are worthy. Do we live that fact every day? Do we, do we live that? And I'm not saying this to put yourself on a pedestal and step out with, Susan Katsal say, Bria Bors. There's a difference in being cocky and confident. Being confident is knowing that I have the love of Christ with me, within me, and I live it out. That's the difference. The cockiness comes out, there's nothing better than I. That's the, that's the difference. And, 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 and Paul refers to that when he uses it in Romans chapter 8. Where he says this in verse, from verse 38. Is it 37? 37, yes. 37, that's Romans chapter 8, 37 to 39. Where it says... No, in all things. The no is in response to the previous verse, verses where it says, What shall separate us from the love of God? Shall hardship, tribulation, trial, temptation, and all of that. And he answers himself in verse 37 where it starts with, No, in all these things, in my trial, in my tribulation, in my problems, in my challenges, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, now that part is important. I am convinced, not that I wonder. I am convinced, which means I know it. Or I think it, I know it. I am convinced. I have all the facts, I've done the research. I am, ik is oortuig, sê die Afrikaans. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, or any power, neither height, depths, or anything else in all creation. Now that's inclusive. Anything else in all of creation. This is what he says. Will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Now, beloved, how do you see yourself? As a soldier in Christ, waging peace. You are loved. You've got the victory. You've got the tools. What are we doing? I'm talking too much. What are we doing? Talk to me. 
Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uncle Brian. Beloved, the Monday section or the Bible study Monday's part deals about with the belt and the breastplate. Now we've got the truth that we are loved. The breastplate of righteousness. Whose righteousness? Ours? Christ's righteousness. Now we, now we need to consider, let's recap again. We unified in Christ, alive through Christ, by Christ. We are loved until death. And now we have the righteousness of Christ as well. So we, we have our commander-in-chief who has won the battle or the victory for us already. He loves us. There's nothing that can separate us from him. We are alive in him and through him and by him. And now we have the righteousness as well, which is protecting us from anything. I almost want to say, what more do you need to wage your peace war? with yourself, with your demons, in ministering, or everything. You have got everything. Really? Is that? You've got everything. Where do we go from here? And the righteousness protects us against everything. So we have those protections. We have those benefits already for us. We need, what does Paul say? Take our stand. We need to put on the armor. We need to take our stand. And once we've taken our stand, we need to square our shoulders and stand firmly. 
because the devil is going to wage war against us. He's going to make war against us. That's a fact. He's going to come for us. And when we continue in the Bible study, the next section talks about the shoes. The shoes in the passage of the armor of God refers to the readiness of the gospel. Okay, and I need to go on through this very quickly because there's other things that I would like to touch on as well. It forms part of the armor, a very important part, because that's the whole point of the war, is to spread the gospel. It's not our message, it's Christ's message. And when we have those shoes on and we walk within that, we not only reflect what the armor tells those out there, who we are, what we do, but that we walk in the armor the way we should walk in the armor. What am I saying? I'm saying that when you put on the armor of God, we can't sit still. You can't put on the armor and not wage war. You, you, you can't put on exercise clothes and not go and exercise. You, you, you can't put on work clothes and then you go and run in your work clothes. It doesn't make sense. So when we put on the armor, we need to engage in the battle. We need to engage in the battle. Because we are sure that it's already won for us. And our battle is spreading the gospel. Our battle is growing closer to God. Our battle is, with the help of Christ, fending off the devil. That is our battle. That is the spiritual warfare that I was talking about last week. Whatever comes across your path, that's your battle. That you need to fight, you need to stand and you need to stand firm. And you can stand firm. We can do that. The passage continues further where it talks about the shield of faith. The helmet and the sword. Now the shield of faith, Paul uses the Roman shield. Now I don't know how many Roman movies you've watched, where you've seen it's, it's a huge thing. It's not a small rod. It's a huge, it's a rectangular thing. And it's made of wood. And there's leather on there. And history or the Bible study tells us that when that shield is soaked in water, not even a flaming arrow can harm it or damage it. It extinguishes it. Because it's drained. It can't penetrate. It's a huge rectangular thing, almost as big as the shoulder itself, and it's curved, which means it protects from the attacks from the side. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about a shield? Who's our shield? The psalmist refers to God as our shield time and time again. Now we're unified, alive in Christ. We have the belt of truth. His protection, his righteousness. And he protects us by the shield as well. And when we go on with the helmet of salvation, again, who gives us the salvation? We get the salvation from God. It's God's salvation. Now when Paul says, work out your salvation, what is he referring to? Is it actual works? Or is it what we are doing here? Conversing, discussing, talking about what God means for us. Where is God in our lives? Our dependence on Him. Are we working out that? Hey, Sherwin, you are nothing without the love of God. You are nothing without His righteousness. You are nothing without His grace. You are completely and utterly dependent on God. Beloved, Paul ends the Bible study with practicing battlefield prayers. Philippians 4 verse 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, present your requests to God. I'm going to conclude with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's a passage that you know very well. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. May God bless us as we put on the armor on a daily basis. In Jesus' name.